Um, so, welcome everyone um, to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro Women Veterans Historical Project Annual Women Veterans Luncheon. Uh, my name is Ann Kelsch. I'm the curator of the project. I want to thank you all for being part of the second virtual luncheon. And I'm really looking forward to seeing all of you in person next year. We're gonna be positive um, that everything's gonna be under control. I'm coming to you from Cornwall in the UK and my colleagues are holding down the fort in Greensboro. So before we start, officially there's a couple of, uh, or a few technical notes. Sarah Esther Belinga is Mission Control Center and she's gonna be personing the uh, uh, actual display, so you'll see her and thank her for all she, all she's doing. Uh, if if you can't see the speaker view, which is me right now, and then later other people, please move your mouse to the upper right corner of your screen, and the view option should appear. And then you click on that and make sure speaker view is checked. If you have any technical issues, please top, type them in the chat box. My colleague Sean Mulligan is. Uh, in charge of, of that. And I'm gonna ask you to keep your microphones muted until the end of the program. Okay, so this luncheon marks our 24th year and I could not do this here today or could the project continue to grow without the sustained support of women veterans and their allies, including many of you here today. I just wanna let you go, that, let you know that we are recording this event and Sean, if you could just make sure that is indeed the case. Oh yes, it is recording, because I did promise people. Uh, so once the recording is available, I'll send out a video link to everyone who, uh, who is here. And then there's actually a few, quite a few people that wanted to be here, but couldn't. So I would like to welcome the Veterans Reserve and active duty service members here today. And if you would like to do what is usually my favorite part is the shout out. Um, of yourself and your branches in the chat, you please do so. Okay, Sarah Esther, first slide. So first, uh, please enjoy this video, which was specially recorded for this event by the students at the UNCG Schiffman School of Music performing the Star Spangled. So thank you to the University uh, Chamber Singers. And um, now here is a welcome from Chancellor Gilliam to welcome you on behalf of the university. Hello, I'm Frank Gilliam, Chancellor of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Welcome to the 24th Annual Women Veterans Luncheon. We're here to celebrate the meaningful work of the Betty H. Carter Women Veterans Historical Project and to recognize the remarkable women who are a part of it. Of course, 
None of this would be possible without the sponsorship of the WVHP and the vision and effort of Betty Carter, who established the archive here in 1998. Sadly, Betty passed away just this past September, but her legacy will continue through the momentum she fostered. Her tireless passion, along with the support of women veterans and the university, has lifted the project to become the largest academic archive in the nation dedicated to the history of women's service in the U.S. military and the American Red Cross. With over 700 collections, the project continues to grow and flourish. And just last year alone, 35 new collections and oral histories were added. UNC Greensboro continues to be recognized nationally as a military-friendly school and a best-for-vets institution. These honors are a testament to the hard work of our staff and faculty who support our military students in all aspects of their experience as collegiates. UNCG student veterans make a difference in the classroom and in our community. For those of you who are currently in the classroom, thank you for your sacrifice and for your service. We are honored that you have chosen UNCG for this part of your journey. I'd like to also extend a special thank you to our UNCG alumni. Your presence and support for UNCG and for this project help us preserve our incredible history. Again, it is my honor to welcome you to the 24th Annual Women Veterans Luncheon. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, we've prepared a tribute to Betty Carter. I wanna thank her son, Christopher Carter, for sharing his photos of his mother with us. For those of you who did not know, Women Veterans Historical Project founder, Betty Carter, passed away on September 29th. Betty grew up in Rowan County, North Carolina, and was a graduate of Meredith College and Duke University. Her passions were music and history. While she was still in high school, Betty played piano, organ, and handbells, and was the organist at her home church of Concordia Lutheran in China Grove. Betty was a member of First Lutheran Church in Greensboro, where she served as president of the church council and was a member of the handbell choir for over 30 years. She was also involved in the Greensboro City Schools PTA and served as president of the Greensboro Council of PTAs. Betty worked at the North Carolina Department of Archives and then, starting in 1974, with the UNCG Library's Special Collections and University Archives Department. In 1998, she founded the Women Veterans Historical Project. Betty retired in 2010 as a university archivist. After her retirement, Betty enjoyed her beloved cats, traveling to the Outer Banks, collecting pottery, and reading. Thank you to Betty for all that you did to preserve the history of American service women. I have always been interested in World War II history. Mm -hmm. I've always been interested in world and European history more than I have American history. Women's history, and I'm very strong on that. Women are 
been forgotten, ignored, and you know, I can get off on a high horse on that. But anyway, sure. but the World War II, I was never able to pull World War II and women together. And it was in the late 90s, I kept hearing about veterans projects. And guess what? They were always men. Right, so I started reading and looking at veterans projects. Saw about the Whimsa in Washington, the Women's Memorial. And I thought, that's what we need to do. I can cover uh, women's history. Mm -hmm. Women from this school were joined up various units. But women's history, and I can pull my World War II interest in. No, yeah. they were ready to talk. Have you ever been a man in a group of probably 92, 90 women? I mean, yeah. can you imagine? I mean, yes. <laughs> but uh, I remember I spoke that day and I, I took a gray box, a regular gray box with me to speak. And I said, it's your job to fill this box. Oh, and nice. yeah, they looked at me like I was weird, but anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's on, you've got to save your history. No one else is going to do it. But right. yeah, we had like that, I think it was around 80 to 90 people at that first lunch. So it wasn't too hard to convince them that they were, oh, no. their stories were worth oh, hearing. And the, you see, they've always thought they were worth it, but they've always accepted, right. well, well, you know. Right. You know, we uh, even, when we started doing interviews, we wanted to interview the woman by herself. We would never wanted her husband there. You mm -hmm. know why? Right. He would take over mm -hmm. because she would just sit there prim and proper and let him. Right. You different, feel like yelling at him. Different time, different culture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As men had been used to this, you know. But you talk to men, every one of them has either been on Iwo Jima, Mount Suribachi, or they were on, at Omaha Beach, I mean. Yeah, right. But, yeah, some of the women just typed letters, but those letters were necessary. Mm -hmm. Well, adding more women, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the, you wanted to have WC women, and you had to all had to sort of just go with the flow. A lot of people thought it was just a WC project. No, you have to keep telling people it's the state right. of North Carolina it's project. A lot of education. Yeah, a lot. Exactly. And uh, you know, uh, as you add more wars, we'll always have plenty of people to interview. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, yeah. but. Um, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, it just, we still use, I think they're still using the basic questions that we had from the beginning, I'm not real sure, but that's one way you could always expand it. Mm -hmm. But um, they were never afraid to talk. But again, it's more outreach too. Mm -hmm. Getting people to understand that women contributed. And so now I've always listened whenever they're talking about historical military things, they all say men and women. Used to be, they didn't say women, right. they said men. Right. So I'm always pleased. I take credit for it, but, sure. but it's not, I mean, it's lots of credit, you know, I'm just being silly. Uh, yes, thank you, Betty. And um, yes, they, people are now saying on Veterans Day yesterday, um, you know, the Google Doodle, for example, has both men and women in the doodle. If you had any, if you have any memories of Betty that you'd like to share, um, please feel free to stay to the end of the program and uh, we've made time for that. And now we're gonna turn to, uh, to me here. Here are some photos of me. Uh, here, I got over here uh, for the fall semester and um, talk a little bit about that. And I'm, I am staying in rural, rural Cornwall. So I'm going to share an update of, let's see if I can do this. This is the one tricky thing that I need to be in charge of. So uh, Okay, are you all able to see project update? Yes, okay. Thanks, Barbara. Um, all right, let me pull this up. So I'm gonna talk about uh, what's been going on in the project in 
since we all met last year and a little bit about what I'm doing over here. So since last year, we've actually added um, 21 new oral history interviews um, from women who served uh, from World War, II, World War II up through women who served through the 2000s. And we've interviewed women from every branch and that includes the Coast Guard and the Cadet Nurse Corps from World War II. And all but one of those interviews were um, done via Zoom. Your photos from two of those uh, women on the left is Carolyn Miller Comfort. She served in the Women's Army Corps and the Army from 1967 to 1998. And on the right is Rome Davis, and she served in World War II. And she was a member of uh, the 6888, the Central Postal Unit, which were the um, historically very important. They were the first all black female unit to be sent overseas. And um, if you notice that these two images are from the army. And I said, we interviewed people from all the branches, but none of those women have sent us photos. So please, <laughs> if we don't have your photos, please send them because I, you know, use them for a lot of events. We lose, use them in instruction. Uh, so besides oral history interviews, we've also done, um, a, you know, additions to existing collections. For example, the poster on the right, it goes in our, um, you know, poster collection or general printed materials. And that is um, probably, you know, basically recruiting poster for women Marines from the 1950s. And on the left there is a um, scrapbook that we purchased that was put together by Captain Louise McLeod. She was a arm, an army nurse during the Korean War. And in the early 1950s, she served at the combined third and 14th field hospitals in Pusan, Korea, and sometime at the 343rd Army Hospital in Tokyo, Japan. And um, it was, I was very excited to be able to get this. We just don't have a lot of history of women who served uh, during, overseas during the Korean War. And we just, uh, just ordered and received a um, a new set of mostly scrapbooks and um, again very excited about those and scrapbooks can be used um, you know not only you know just as a story of an individual women veterans experience but also you know photographs you know can show what um, everything from you know hospitals are like or, or camps and um, you know soldiers and sailors at that time so this one is a um, album that belonged to Irma Riedel, or Riedel. She was from Saline, Michigan, and she served in the U.S. Army Corps um, as a nurse in, from 1918 to 1920. So these photographs were um, about, there's almost 350 of them that she took, and then almost 80 that were commercial photographs that were purchased. She trained at Fort Des Moines, Iowa um, between May and September, 1918. And the photographs include images taken there at the fort um, of nurses and soldiers, as well as a photo of a waffle party held by nurses at the local park. Uh, she went over to France in December, 1918 and through June, 1919. And there's photographs of Camp Kerhoun, K-E-R-H-O-U-N in France. And they include images of the patients in the hospital, the hospital wards, uh, different camp buildings, and some including a recreational center operated by the American Red Cross, uh, interior shots of the mess hall, patients' wards, and an operating room. Oh, here's some of the images from that. Okay, this next album belonged to a WAC um, who at Camp Oglethorpe, Georgia during World War II. And uh, the actual title page says, Evolution of Catherine B. Serwinski from Civilian First Class to Technical Sergeant WAC, June 30th, 1943 to March 20th, 1946. Most of the album is devoted to her time with the Headquarters Detachment at WAC Third Training Center 
Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, between 1944 and 1946. So there's portraits of Sir Winsky, who's out there on the left, um, other images of a rare Georgia snowstorm. Um, here's an official photograph of a pre-Christmas tea held in December 1944. Um, here's photos she took of Ovita Culp Hobby, who was the first director of the Women's Army Corps. And there's other photographs of, you know, fellow WACs, um, the mess hall, the WAC training center band on parade, um, and of various um, WAC officers. And uh, here is an album of promotional photos. These were official photos um, of Navy waves during World War II. And these, not quite sure why they were taken, but um, they are excellent. And they show um, you know, a variety of promotional photos, mostly of different um, jobs that, let's see, of, did I, yeah. Um, you know, parades and different jobs that the waves did on the bottom right there. Um, that's a wave in a link trainer, which was um, sort of, I, Barb can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's sort of the first um, uh, training step for pilots, so. You are correct. Whew. And I'm guessing okay. that the, probably the top left photo was a review of the troops by a senior officer, as opposed yes. to a parade. Yes, yes. Um, and here's some other of the jobs that Waves did. Um, figure on the bottom right is air traffic control and top left is photography and other ones are mapping things I don't really understand. Okay, this next one is a photo album belonging to Ellen Halstein. She was a United States Army nurse who served at the 231st Station Hospital in England, 1943 to 1945. And it has photographs and newspaper clippings and um, a variety of ephemeral items, which I'll explain what those are. Mostly depict her time in England, um, has the hospital buildings, um, nurses posing, relaxing on the grounds, nurses at drill, an interior view of an orthopedic ward, parties, social events, nurses socializing with their soldier dates, sightseeing trips to Norwich, Newmarket, Scotland, members of the 389th Bomb Group um, and other soldiers. There's a hand-drawn broadside for um, an officer's nurse's dance, and um, which is considered ephemera, which is material that was kind of created like a flyer for a party or a dance that was not considered to be kept very long. It was just an ephemeral item is something that you know, it was just created for an event and not expected to be saved, like a book, for example. Um, and what else? We have dance. There's also things that um, a song sheet um, with an army nurse song, and I love collecting the different song sheets. This one I hadn't heard yet. Uh, some of the lyrics are, you know, it takes a lot of guts to be an army nurse. I've been one for almost two months and few things could be worse. Oh my, I guess if you're serving intense in the mud in World War II, that, that would definitely be true. Um, so, you know, different programs for uh, holidays, newspaper and newspaper clippings, including one that was published in a local newspaper. It was a letter that she wrote about her time in England caring for Air Corps casualties. And the last one I'm gonna show, cause you know, wanna want make sure I get it, all, all the branches. Uh, this is a scrapbook compiled by Lieutenant Marion Murphy of the Marine Corps Women's Reserve Band. And that band was the only women's band to serve in the Marines. And the, um, the album uh, goes from 1944 to 1946. It has 61 photographs and other uh, things like ephemeral items, newspaper clippings, photographs of the band on their home base, um, camp, which is Camp Lejeune here in North, well, there in North Carolina, here in North Carolina, I don't know, uh, but also on tour at Paris Island, South Carolina, Washington, DC, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And they include rehearsals, um, the band on parade, the tour bus, the band members relaxing, and here on the bottom there, a photo of the Women's Reserve Dance Band, which was a swing band, which I didn't know about until now, 
Um, there's programs, flyers, and there's a nine page typed script uh, that was done for promotional purposes in 1944 on NBC radio. And it features in the script, they're Marines facing the problems of war fairly and squarely, but they're also women, exclamation point. Women who will someday return to the homes. Ah, yes. Anyway, um, and also a card, uh, a card signed by the band members and a mimeographed copy of a uh, band will, which I, was pretty common. I know that we have in uh, women's college um, collections, you, I guess the people in a group sort of write a, a funny will of what they bequeath to the other members. And one of them is, I, Dorothy Burlow, leave my tiny waistline to Miriam Smith so she won't have to exercise every morning. I enjoyed that. Another thing that's uh, let's see, new uh, that we've done is uh, I'd mentioned that we've gotten a clear grant um, to digitize. Um, it was called a Recordings at Risk grant. And the first 200 or so interviews, oral history interviews, were done on audio cassette. And um, they are not a stable format. So not only were they digitized, um, our digital projects uh, unit, David Gwynn, and uh, we were able to hire some people and they were able to put um, these interviews uh, that had been digitized for the grant in, in ohms. And I'll show what that is. And that stands for oral history metadata synchronizers. So I uh, just want to give a little explanation of who Mary Matthews was. She was from Greenville, South Carolina, and she served in the American Red Cross from 1943 to 1946. Uh, she served assigned to a Red Cross club in Essex, England, and then she was promoted to a club in Norwich, England, and then transferred back to Essex in the summer of 44. She later went uh, to Paris with the 386th Bomb Group and then was moved to Le Havre, France in April 1945. And then she was next stationed in Fulda, Germany with the Club Mobile, um, and she stayed with the Red Cross until March 1946. On our website, gosh, I hope this works. So in, um, let's see, so we have what, um, you know, we certainly had before, which, you know, certainly important too, a keyword searchable uh, transcript, but for in ohms, what we didn't have the capability of force to be able to, again, search things, we index the, um, we index them, which is kind of basically a summary, like, uh, you know, the veterans talking about this at this time, and you can clip on the audio clips. So let's see. We're you were at about... Mahar, were you at Mahar, uh, through uh, DJ Day in August? No, I was in Germany by then. Okay. So uh, you were at Mahar for PE Day. Did they, did they lock you all down at the base and say, don't go anywhere? Or what was <laughs> PE Day like for you? Well, we were in, the girls were all in Jeeps riding through the streets. and. Uh, but it, I wrote to my, my mother and said it wasn't, the, the French weren't very enthusiastic. They just looked weary. And the, the planes of the, the guys we knew were flying overhead. We were riding in the jeeps. And it, I, I wrote mother that it was a very somber sort of parade because there was no band playing. And uh, I don't know, it, it wasn't very exciting. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so that's that's something I'm very excited for. All right, so that's um, kind of WVHP news. So here I am abroad. This is a little little uh, little report. So um, I was given the opportunity to live in Cornwall for the fall semester, and so I was trying to figure out what I would do over here. And I looked through the collections and the WVHP, and I found that. Uh, 10 Army nurses, six American Red Cross personnel, uh, 10 WACs, and actually two British women who um, were interviewed way in the beginning were stationed um, in England during World War II. And um, so I'm trying to, you know, see what information I can find and, and sort of any British, um, you know, stories, you know, from probably from, you know, their children of um, the British that interacted with these women. So and any document, <clears throat> sorry, any documents that I can find. It's a bad time to lose my voice. Okay, so doing some research, I found out that during World War II, there were about 200 US hospitals, um, uh, military hospitals in England. 
the Women's Army Corps. Um, they had soldiers attached to the 8th and 9th Army Air Forces. And also they were in London at Shafe, the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces. And then throughout the country, there were about 2,000 Red Cross staff workers, and they staffed over um, 250 service clubs and um, were, of course, in uh, club mobiles. And I have a photo of one of those, if you don't know. Um, and they were assisted by uh, nearly 13,000 British volunteers and nearly 10,000 paid employees. So this is where I am at the very lower tip of England and sorry, um, get the sense that England is quite small and everything is easy to get to until you live in Cornwall. And it's very hard to, to, uh, to get anywhere. I, I've been reading history of Cornwall and um, you know, England has, uh, their history uh, you know, includes the Romans taking over it in like 50, but um, so they took over most of England, but just couldn't bother getting over the river to Truro because it was just, I mean, to Cornwall, because it was just too hard. And uh, this is a photo nearby my house. Um, the road is considered, that is considered a large two lane road, which it is not. <laughs> so uh, driving is, is very challenging here. There's a lot of tucking into the side and letting cars pass. And in the bottom left, Cornwall doesn't really consider themselves uh, part of England, even though officially they are. You don't ever see Union Jacks or uh, the English flag of St. George's Cross being flown. Uh, well, you see what this is the official Cornwall flag at St. Piran's flag. And uh, St. Piran, let me see, I looked this up. He was a fifth century Cornish abbot. And there's a lot of churches here. Um, Cornwall was, you know, pagan for a long time, and then it was Catholic for a long time, and these churches are named after saints that I have never heard of, so there's a lot of Cornish history here. So before I got to Cornwall, of course, I had to come through London and uh, spend a couple days there, and walking down Whitehall, um, I just stumbled upon this, and this uh, is a 22-foot bronze memorial to uh, the British women who served in World War II, uh, the lettering on the um, memorial is replicates the typeface used on wartime ration books. Uh, there are seven, so basically it's uh, different sets of, of uniforms that British women um, wore during the war. So they, and symbolizing the jobs they took. So uh, uniforms worn by the Women's Land Army who basically took over farming, um, the Women's Royal Naval Service, nursing cape, a police overall and a welding mask. So that was very exciting to come across. So here, uh, bottom left is Cornwall, and then to the east a little bit is Devon. These two counties were, well, they're the closest to me, and they were primarily, in terms of Americans, involved. Um, mostly the Americans came down here to prepare for the D-Day invasion. So here on October 7th, um, I managed to get myself an interview with uh, the mid-morning program for Radio Cornwall. Um, I am still, that is a hard, if you ever get an interview on BBC and they said, hey, send us a picture, they're going to put it that large. So it's, uh, anyway, big guest. I was the big guest on that day. And I spoke about um, American women, service women in England during World War II and, and uh, what I was trying to look for. And um, just a little history here, uh, about 10 minutes away. This is uh, Pendennis Point in Falmouth. And over there is, that's France and Spain out there. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of German, Cornwall was, you know, had to guard being invaded and a lot of German, uh, you know, activity there during World War II. Over there in the upper right, that's Pendennis Castle. And this is the castle and that was built uh, for King Henry VIII in 1540. And, uh, pretty much guarding, you know, a castle, a fort to guard essentially the west coast of England um, against the perceived threat of Spanish and, Spanish and French invasion. So it was used um, as a fortification for many, many wars. After World War I, they uh, dismantled everything because that was going to be the war to end all wars, and of course it wasn't. So in 1939, they um, had to restart it, and it was also used as communications point. So I wandered up there and that is a half moon battery there that's still there. 
Um, there's also a lot of um, different pillboxes around, around the coast. And then this one is uh, a quick firing gun that was added to um, deal with the threat of e-boats, which were fast motor torpedo boats. And there were a lot of uh, several engagements between uh, the Falmouth's coastal defenses and German e-boats. Let's see, I just want to check the time. Okay, 12.07. Okay, so um, over in the next county in Devon, uh, I went to Plymouth, um, and here's a you know here's some historical images. This is an American, you know, Devon and Plymouth were bombed during the war, um, and the Americans came down. This is it looks like naval um, American personnel at uh, American Cross Clubmobile. The American Red Cross had these refurbished buses. They went to, to where U.S. troops were and gave them um, you know coffee and gum, cigarettes, and donuts. They made donuts in there, and they're nicknamed the Donut Dollies. Uh, here's what a hospital kind of would look like um, back then. This is a naval hospital around Plymouth. Um, also, this is where a very, Plymouth uh, on Saltash was uh, where a very big um, uh, troops left to, for the invasion of D-Day. This was the soldiers of the 5th and 7th Corps they left from Saltash Passage for Omaha and Utah beaches. I'm trying to find information, um, you know, as I said, there are a lot of hospitals, but one I'm very interested in is called the Eighth Field Hospital because they are, uh, were based in Camp Butner, which is half hour uh, north of Durham. So they arrived in Great Britain in early fall 1943 and moved around a lot and, you know, basically, would move to a muddy cricket field and have to clean it up and you know set up tents where they lived and also tents that were the the wards um in december 43 they were stationed near where i was and they acted as the station hospital from troops for the 29th u.s infantry division who were the ones that um right from here they were the americans that went over um for the d-day invasion uh, so they were over here, that's where I went, trying to find a remainder of one of their, the Crown Hill Barracks, which is now a office uh, building, business center, excuse me. That's spelled T-R-E, of course. And so they left uh, from here and they, you know, on June 27th, which is what, D plus, oh, math, 14? No, seven, okay. I, I don't know why I'm showing off math. I'm gonna keep going, but a, few, you know, a week or so after D-Day, um, and so they went over to France and then from France, they followed the army to Holland and then Germany and then back to France, um, you know, after VE day. I also took a day trip to Exeter. Um, and of course you have to visit the Exeter Cathedral, which was open on, um, in 1400. And um, I've also noticed that um, instead of Veterans Day, they call it Remembrance Day here, um, you know, 11-11. And it's very big. There's a lot, I found, you know, a lot of monuments and, you know, red poppy day to honor, um, you know, the fallen sort of like we do in Memorial Day. In the chapel, I'm um, sorry, in the cathedral, there's many chapels. And one of them was the chapel for the Devonshire Regiment found in 1685. Um, and here are some of photos from the impressive chapel here. And that was for, um, you know, that's on the, one of the walls uh, honoring the men that fell um, in World War I. All right, I'm gonna finish this off um, with a, a few quotes from a, during my research I found um, there was given out to all American servicemen, of course, instructions for American servicemen in Britain 19, it was uh, given out in, uh, or published in 1942 to tell Americans how to behave here. And just a few selections from it. You are now in Great Britain as part of an allied offensive to meet Hitler and beat him on his own ground. For the time being, you will be Britain's guest. The purpose of this guide is to start getting you acquainted with the British, their country and their ways. A um, couple points, if you're invited to eat with the family, don't eat too much. Otherwise, you may eat up their weekly rations. 
Don't make fun of British speech or accents. You sound just as funny to them, but they are too polite to show it. Uh, don't try to tell the British that American won the last war or make wisecracks about the war debts uh, or about British defeats in this war. Um, and this is the only one that was uh, bolded. Never criticize the king or queen. And to finish, um, you will soon find yourself among a kindly, quiet, hardworking people who have been living under a strain such as few people in the world have ever known. The British welcome you as friends and allies, but remember that crossing the ocean doesn't automatically make you a hero. There are housewives in aprons and youngsters in knee pants in Britain who have lived through more high explosives and air raids than many soldiers saw in the first class barrages in the last year, war. And then the last line that I uh, excerpt I took, the British don't know how to make a good cup of coffee. You don't know how to make a good cup of tea. It's an even swap. Uh, so thank you. So we're moving on to the next section. I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, moving on to our keynote speaker, who I hope is here. Um, I'm going to introduce her. I'm here. You're here. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let me just introduce you, Dr. Brooks. Thank you for joining us. Today. Uh, and a dog. Okay. No, I love dogs. So might have to show us your dog. Did you have a question before I introduce you? No, no? it's just, um, I'm just warning you, the dogs will bark and my husband will come home very soon and he knows to come in and shepherd them, but it might be a bit, it'll get rowdy because they've not seen him since this morning. So clearly they'll be okay. desperate. All right. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Okay. Go dogs. Um, Dr. Brooks, <laughs> uh, whose PhD RN is a senior lecturer in the School of Health Sciences at the University of Manchester, uh, England. She is proud to support a range of nursing history associations across the globe, including recently as the chair of publications for the American Association of, for the History of Nursing, communications officer for the UK Association for the History of Nursing. And she sits on the steering committee for both the European Association for the History of Nursing and the Royal College of Nursing History of Nursing Forum. Dr. Brooks' research has focused on nursing in the Second World War for nearly a decade. She was the 2015 recipient, along with Christine Hollett, of the American Association for the History of Nursing, Mary M. Roberts Award for the edited book, 100 Years of Wartime Nursing Practices. And she has published extensively on nursing work in active service overseas and on the home front. Her book, Negotiating Nursing, British Army Sisters and Soldiers in the Second World War, uses personal testimony to uncover the nurses' own understandings of their work and place in the medical team. Her current project, which is supported by the Eleanor Crowder Bajoring, uh, close, uh, by, by, sorry, Ms. Eleanor Crowder, um, fellowship from the University of Virginia, and the H-15 grant of the American Association for the History of Nursing examines Jewish refugees who entered the nursing profession in Britain and provided valuable war work in the overstretched hospitals during the Second World War into the new uh, NHS. So Dr. Brooks's uh, talk is entitled Masters of Improvisation, Military Nurses <laughs> on Active Service in the Second World War. So please uh, welcome Dr. Brooks and her dogs. So we're gonna have a Q&A afterwards if you have any questions that um, you would like to ask. So please just type them into a chat or at the end, um, you can ask a question and um, you know the ones in the chat, we will read out to Dr. Brooks. So thank you, Dr. Brooks. Um, please call me Jane. Dr. Brooks okay, is my well, Sunday name. <laughs> okay, well, it what, is what Friday. people call me so. when I'm in trouble. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I was just trying try to be trying to be extra polite here. All right. So, uh, Jane, you're on. Thank you. Okay. Let's just see. Let's get me screen sharing first because that's always the scary bit. Dis host disabled participant screen sharing. I can't share my screen, Beth Ann. Hello. Let's work on that here. Um, okay. Sir Esther, let's see. Um, participants, I'm now, participants, Sarah, Esther, you have any idea how to do this? I can't remember. Uh, you need to make me a co-host. 
I think it should right. work oh, now. It's all right. It's on. We're on. We're on. Is it on? That's, can you see that? There we go. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Can you see that? I we can. Excellent. Thank Brilliant. you. Brilliant. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to um, thank Beth Ann for inviting me. It's a real privilege to talk to you today. Um, and uh, I hope that what I can say is, is of some interest to some of you. So thank you for the invitation. Masters of Improvisation, Military Nurses on Active Service in the Second World War. In December 1943, Hildegard Peplau, who would later become the most influential psychiatric nurse of the 20th century, began her correspondence to her parents in the United States on V-mail, V for victory. She was in England and excited to be assigned to the 312th Military Hospital for Neuropsychiatry at Shugborough Park in the England Midlands County of Staffordshire. Perhaps when she arrived, her enthusiasm was, her enthusiasm was dampened to find the nurses were to bunk in Nissan huts with, ex, with tented extensions. Years later, in an oral history interview, she admitted, the area in general was damp and foggy and climactic conditions were not ideal. They had coal stoves, which whilst giving out some warmth, polluted the air and made breathing difficult. If it was grim for the nurses and doctors, at least they could go off duty to the mess where the officers shared their ration cards to keep the bar open. For the patients, there was no such relief. According to Peplau's biographer, Barbara Calloway, their soldier patients would arrive in the ever-present drizzle, carried through the mist and unceremoniously dumped into bed. Treatments such as insulin coma therapy and prolonged narcosis meted out to some patients would create in Peplau a conviction that many of them were barbaric and achieved little in terms of improvement. Rather, she advocated talking therapies and of course was to be vindicated in this belief. Peplau was not alone as a wartime nurse to use this time to develop ideas and beliefs about health practices, though she was fortunate to be able to continue to be able to progress her ideas after the war. Many nurses who volunteered for active service overseas created new and exciting ways to nurse the sick and injured, only to return home at the end of the war and return to stultifying hospital regimes, regimes they could not wait to leave and frequently did. Even before Britain declared war on Germany on the 3rd of September, 1939, nurses across the nation clamored to join the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service Reserve, hereafter the QAs. The nurses embraced the shift from the physically and psychologically safe spaces of the hospital and nurses' home to war zones. The military medical authorities' appreciation of the sort of hardships that nurses could and should manage was more cautious. Following the declaration of war, female nurses of the British Army were amongst the first contingent of medical services personnel to enter France. Whatever the men thought about women in the war zone, and there were many voices against their presence, the presence of nurses so far forward, the knowledge that early treatments led to greater success rates meant that for the first time, a critical mass of QAs were posted close to ongoing battles alongside their medical colleagues to provide increasingly complex treatment for combatants. When one US Army hospital was, was ordered to New Guinea in 1942, the American Journal of Nursing, re Nursing reported, the nurses brought order out of chaos in a land where two years ago, most people said women could not live. Despite early enthusiasm by American nurses, volunteering for the Army Nurse Corps receded into what Barbara Brooks Tomlin maintains was a slow trickle at a time when the need for army nurses was mushrooming. Nevertheless, by mid-1941, the numbers were increasing, though not to the extent that were required. By October 1941, the Corps was still 1,000 nurses short. When America joined the war in December 1941, the numbers of nurses volunteering for active service increased further. Though a month later, an editorial in the American Journal of Nursing maintained that American nurses are now needed in great numbers to care for the armed services and relieve the suffering of helpless people in hospital. However, 
When the Allies reached North Africa by 1942, US Army nurses were there alongside the troops. For the next three years, US Army nurses continued to volunteer and accept overseas postings to support the war effort. When nurse Sally Hitchcock graduated with her master's degree in nursing in 1944, despite my mother's horror at my wanting to serve, I felt compelled to go and help. I was excited and determined to use all my training to help mend as many injured men and women as I could and help them come home to their families and loved ones. Notwithstanding the determination of army nurses from both Britain and the US, to develop their nursing skills for the benefit of soldier patients, they were impacted by a range of forces which they were powerless or struggled to affect. These forces included the weather, the physical environment and the physical environment in which they worked. The emotional impact of caring for men who may have been their dancing partners a few nights before, or sending men back to battle who they'd nursed back from life, back to life. The nurses had to manage periods of utter boredom, followed by days and nights with little sleep or rest during a battle. And they had to manage the gender boundaries they faced as often the only allied women in a war zone. The purpose of my talk today is to explore the nurses' management of two of these forces, the external force of the physical environment, particularly the weather, and the internal forces they struggled to manage, specifically being women in the hyper-masculine space of war. Weather in all war zones had a considerable effect on the nurses and their patients, but it was also the ramifications of war condition, weather conditions that significantly, ham significantly hampered the effectiveness of the nurse-patient encounter. Men expected their nurses to be kind and provide bodily comforts for them, but the freezing night temperatures in night wards, rainfall that flooded whole hospitals, and insects that abounded in tropical climes meant that whilst the nurses wanted to ease the trials of war, such comforts were not straightforward. The conditions of war across the globe assaulted men's bodies and placed them under tremendous strain of disease and poor health. In the tropics, men fell to, to malaria, bilharzia, heat, exha heat exhaustion and heat stroke, whilst in the far north, they developed frostbite, trench foot and snow blindness. Historians of medicine, <coughs> and war in the 20th century have considered the impact of poor weather on the troops. They've examined amongst other tragedies, a typhus epidemic caused by the inability to maintain personal hygiene in the trenches on the Eastern Front. Historian Joanna Bork explores the legendary sub-zero te sub temperatures at Stalingrad that led to the deaths of thousands of German troops from hypothermia and diseases associated with it. So although there, but although there is an acknowledgement that poor weather led to disease, death, and then sometimes failure to win battles, discussions of weather seems to be tangential to the actual medical care required or provided by the troops, for the troops. The importance of the external environment to creating safe spaces in which successful nursing care can occur has meant that historians of war nursing offer more detailed narratives regarding weather conditions. Many of these accounts have been focused on the First World War, although arguably the weather and mud of the Western Front are, like the Christmas truces, part of the legend of that earlier conflict. As historian Kirsty Harris, Harris maintains, weather affected almost every aspect of nursing, significantly adding to the workload and forcing the nurses to change their usual processes. Poor weather conditions hampered caregiving and risked the development of other diseases. Nursing is often cast as feminine work, a work which has its antecedents in the domestic work often associated with the work of women, feeding, making comfortable, keeping dry, keeping warm. Certainly in the training programmes and British and US hospitals from which the nurses came, the life and the, their life and work was grounded in obedience, repetition, ritual, and an acceptance that their critical thinking skills were less important than their ability to get the work done. However, as I have argued elsewhere, the challenging environment of war depended, such work depended on nurses having autonomy and implementing more, mas the ma more masculine skills of innovation and ingenuity in order to manipulate the surroundings into habitable places. 
creating safe and comfortable spaces to heal required skills which link the nurse's judgments to ones that are high in indeterminacy. That is skills more usually associated with the critical judgments of medicine and men. The nurses on overseas service needed to shift their understanding of the way nurses worked and develop into innovative professionals with incredible rapidity. An article to the American Journal of Nursing in September 1943 was clear in its analysis of the nursing war. Wartime nursing is different. It continued, decisions as to the amount and kind of nursing must be based on essentiality and not on preference. The essentials of good nursing must be taught and must be practiced, but the distribution of nursing service is different. It calls for the imagination and administrative skills and for all the arts of diplomacy which the profession, which the profession is possessed. I argue that the work of nurses on active service overseas reversed the more usual ideas about men and women's wartime work. Women historians of the Second World War have explored the feminization of masculine work such as engineering and espionage, as women moved into such roles for the duration as their menfolk went to fight. I argue that the manner in which British and US army nurses managed their environment masculinized the very feminine work of home building. Whilst I do not wish to herald the work of men over that of women, men's work has and continues to be placed of a higher order than women's, and of course is usually paid more. That nurses manage to achieve even a semblance of comfort for their patients is perhaps a miracle. Furthermore, they continued, as American historian of women Cynthia Enlow argues, to exist on an ideological knife edge. One that needed nurses to be in forward areas, yet required them to continue to be feminine all the time demanding that they work in constant danger and manage the hostile surroundings in a way that supported their combatant patients, clearly an almost impossible task, yet one they accepted and performed with, no doubt, previously unacknowledged talents. As historian of the US Army Nurse Corps, Mary Sarnecki argues, one hallmark of the Army nurse is her ability to overcome environmental difficulties. They were going to be able to prove their capacity for such work over and over again. The creation of spaces conducive to healing was a critical aspect of the provision of good nursing care. It had formed an important part of the advice given to women since Florence Nightingale. In Notes on Nursing, originally written in 1859, Nightingale directed her advice on how to care for the sick room of to the lady of the house. In the 1906 edition of A Textbook of Nursing, American nurse Clara Week Shaw maintained that, I quote, the comfort and well-being of the invalid depends so great an extent upon his surroundings. According to Evelyn Pierce, a British nurse and author of several articles and texts on nursing, in her 1937 edition of A General Textbook of Nursing, she says, a nurse with the gift of making her patients feel at home and fear, free from fear inspires confidence and provides an atmosphere of peace, serenity and security, which is so important an adjunct to the relaxation of mind and body necessary for recovery from disease. All these injunctions carry a twofold purpose, to provide comfort for the patient and to provide an environment that is physically healthful to support healing. The nurses of the British and US armies, having trained in the hospital and for some US nurses the college system, would have been well versed in the need to create and maintain an environment in which healing could take pay place. The zones in which they were posted during the Second World War and the spaces they were given in which to care for their patients were, however, rarely either favourable to health or to the serenity and security needed for recovery. I'm just going to say one quick note that British nurses were called nursing sisters. There's no reference here to um, religious women. US nurse Mary Elizabeth Ahern recalled in her oral history that they traveled across Europe following the troops, sometimes only two or three miles behind the battle. As the European weather deteriorated from September to December 1944, they cared for soldiers with horrendous injuries in tented hospitals during the Battle of Hurtgen Forest, the longest single battle fought by the US Army. Across different world zones, nurses cared for their combatant patients in atrocious winters with howling winds, pouring rain and snow, and summers in the desert and the tropics with stifling sun, desert winds and sand. 
everywhere. British nursing sister Agnes Morgan wrote to her mother of their hospital in Italy that had previously been a prisoner of war camp. Situated, was in a, situated as it was in a little hollow, the mountains are close in on us and most forbidding. It has rained unceasingly since our arrival, torrential downpours with biting cold dusts blowing intermittently. However, the day after we arrived, our first convoy of 100 came in, and then the next day, another 100, and then the next, nearly 200. Not long after arriving to care for the troops at the Anzio beachhead, an anonymous sist nursing sister recalled the arrival of rain. After prolonged, bitterly cold weather, the ground was unable to cope with the water, so the hospital flooded. With the battle continuing around them, the patients could not be evacuated, so their beds sunk deeper and deeper into the earth. She said, stretchers were raised on ration boxes, but the water still rose. Hospital beds sank lower and lower until they were not much above ground level, and we waged a constant war attempting to keep patients, wards and bedding dry. The Anzio beachhead proved a harsh environment for the US nurses as also. In an article to the American Journal of Nursing in April 1944, Ruth White from the American Red Cross wrote, it was a familiar scene to the nurses of a frontline field hospital who had been shunted from one battlefield to another since it started following the 5th Army up from Salerno Bay 12 days after the first landings in September. The tents marked with big red crosses set up in the mud, rain falling continuously and pouring under the canvas in streams. Critically wounded men lying in their cots, awaiting operations or undergoing operations, bottles of blood plasma hanging over each cot and feeding tubes clamped to their faces. The concussion of artillery, the smell of anesthesia and medicine in the dimly lit wards, the swift moving of patients and equipment out of shell range, the day by day living in a tent with a dirt floor and a small stove that looked lost in the row of cots lining each side of the canvas wall, all that had become part of the daily experience. Elsewhere across the globe, conditions were no better for the nurses or their patients. One territorial army nursing sister wrote to their matron in chief of the particular problems in Iraq. This time the hospital was under canvas and when we arrived the weather was bitterly cold and we all felt this very acutely having come from a comparatively warm Palestine. It only rained for about three days in the part we were in, but as a result, the whole countryside was under water for at least three weeks, and a long time the roads were impassable. The soil was clay and the water did not sink in. The hospital was about half a mile from the mess, and by the time we arrived on duty, we were covered with mud and hardly able to move with cold. Our tents, the tents we worked in were not very waterproof, and when it rained, we had to put buckets all the way down the middle of each tent and had to wear storm caps, Macintoshes and Wellington boots, as well as any obtainable article of warm clothing. We worked under very active service conditions with one primer stove to heat everything for three tents and a crude oil burner to heat the patient's washing water. There, was a crude oil there were crude oil heaters in each tent, which gave out a certain amount of warmth. At one time, it was so cold that even the crude oil froze. US Army nurse Taft Barre was posted to the European war zone and ended up caring for soldiers at the Battle of the Bulge. Her tented hospital opened on the 16th of November, 1944, in a field in Belgium. This, the hospital, working in this hospital as Europe held it into winter, they had three pot-bellied stoves, but the soldiers just arrived in blankets. They were brought in on stretchers and laid down on these cement floors. Then the doctors would evaluate where they were to go, and then they'd send them to the wards. And we'd get these patients just wrapped in blankets. So the first thing we did was wash them up, get them cleaned up because they didn't have uniforms. They were probably bloody, frozen. We'd get pajamas on them. We'd medicate them if they needed medication. We'd reinforce their dressings if they needed reinforcing. Then we'd feed them, gave them a good hot meal because a lot of them hadn't eaten for a while. Even without trying to combat disease and injury, managing the cold and rain and the extreme fluctuations in temperature across the war zones of Europe and the Middle East was a constant trial for nurses and patients alike and worked against the creation of home-like spaces. Excuse me, James, will you close the door, please? Oh, thank you. And worked against the creation of home-like spaces. In conditions, as Sister E.M. Leeming described, 
the winter was atrocious and in the summer very hot and glaring with innumerable storms. For those in the hotter climes, it was the sandstorms and insects that tested everyone's resolve. Nursing sister Underhill noted, we could never decide whether sandstorms were worse when they lashed our cold legs or when they covered us at a temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Sandstorms caught some of the British nurses quite by surprise, learning the hard way that the exigencies of a global war meant that long learned regimes sometimes had to be ignored. The head nurse of a group of newly arrived nursing sisters at Tobruk was appalled to view filthy blankets hanging in the doorways of the wards and demanded that the orderlies remove these ripe drapes. The disgruntled orderlies, orderlies who had at that point, up till that point, been running the ward, did remove them, but only under duress. Probably annoyed at being placed under the authority of a female nurse who had little comp comprehension of desert conditions. Soon after these blankets were removed, a sandstorm blew uninhibited through the wards. They went back up. For those nurses in tropical war zones, the insect and other beasties were a constant trial in their care of men. When nursing sister Penny Salter arrived at Ramri Island off the coast of Burma, the advent of convoys of casualties from Rangoon and Elephant Point coincided with the monsoon season. It rained and it rained and it rained. The monsoon arrived with a vengeance. With the rains, out came the beasties, flying ants, bats and mosquitoes in their droves. All the nursing sisters complained about the mosquitoes and flies, as had their predecessors in the First World War. The flies were everywhere, in their thousands, bringing distress to their patients, their colleagues and themselves, and making nursing care a considerable challenge. Morgan wrote to her mother, Remember that men with helpless arms cannot keep the flies at bay, so the nurses would be feeding the patients and trying to bat away flies at the same time. Um, quite tricky. This inability would have had the inability of men to bat, to get rid of their own flies would have had a considerable effect on them and their health, given that the flies were a source of infection as they bred dysentery and infiltrated wounds and caused sepsis. As one sister in the desert maintained. The campaign against flies was caught, fought quite as much a part of the battle war as any tag battle. Brainy, attractive posters were placed in convenient places. Patients and personnel were all made fly conscious. Fly netting over doors and windows. Refuse was not allowed to accumulate. Fly netting was crucial as without it, the wards were black with them. But it was not only the flies which were constant annoyance to patients. And two, were a significant problem, as one territorial army nursing sister attested. I'd had a very busy night and was preparing to go off duty when a patient called me and said there were things crawling all over his badly burnt leg. On investigation, I found almost a complete ant's nest in the bed. The ants, one of the very small brown kind, had come in the ward window and climbed onto the patient's Vulcan beam and got into his bed in spite of the fact that the legs of the beam had been well saturated in paraffin the day before. It took me nearly three quarters of an hour to remove every ant and to redress his leg. And I thought that I had learnt my lesson and would see that such a thing did not occur again. However, it happened a few mornings later when a sailor with a horribly burnt face, which was completely brown with tannic acid, called and said there seemed to be things, things crawling on his face. After closer examination to my horror, I found found ants all over his face and hand and even in his ears. Apparently he'd moved his locker so that it was touching his bed and the little beasts had got in that way. The nursing sisters' attempts to ensure their patients were safe and comfortable were severely hampered by external conditions and weather and wildlife. Whilst on the wards they had the authority to harness innovative methods to keep their soldier patients safe. Outside the confines of the hospital ward their ability to make a difference was severely hampered by their status as women. Men arrived at casualty clearing stations and hospitals debilitated due to the poor diets and dreadful weather conditions in which they'd been living. They were transported in open cattle trucks in the pouring rain or in searing heat which led to severe burns and disembarked into the open air in snow. Despite the protests of nurses at this treatment of both Allied and Axis troops, as these settings were outside hospital wards, issues of gender, professional subordination 
and the exigencies of war prevented them from influencing a more thoughtful care of the soldiers. <coughs> this disregard for the soldiers by some male officers may well have increased the nurse, uh, nurse's determination to provide comfort, to provide comfort once the, the men were in hospital wards, spaces where nursing sisters were in charge and the expert at the bedside. The issue of the location of the nurse and her power over that space is important for both gender considerations of the female nurse in a war zone and had a crucial impact on their soldier patients. According to um, nursing author Jean Gilmore, nurses actively work to constitute hospitals as home places for patients. Yet this work created unforeseen complications within the status and positioning of female nurses on active service overseas. Crafting the domestic space was seen lacking in, as lacking in complexity. Indeed, as women's work, it was understood as demanding neither skill nor strength. As gender historian Mar Margaret Higginay and colleagues argue, wartime may have impelled women out of the domestic sphere, but only then to place them in another place where they were subordinate to men. The complexities of the position of nursing sisters on active service overseas was, however, perhaps greater than the nurses themselves wished or were able to admit. The reconstitution of hospital wards in a war zone to denote home enabled female nurses to locate themselves in this most masculine of places, a war zone, without the need to ideologically move beyond the family-oriented environment. Nevertheless, by continuing to locate female nurses in a reimagined female space, it often prevented them from taking action outside that situation. All other settings belong to the masculine machine of war. US Army nurse Sally Hitchcock wrote home on the 24th of October, 1944. She told her parents of the lovely evening by the lake, playing bridge and enjoying dinner with some officer friends. However, she admitted to being upset when she discovered these officers all seem to have individual ice boxes in their quarters when many of the hospital wards have to use boxes filled with ice, which we originally used to refrigerate blood. I found this most upsetting and not right. On the ships that transported nurses and combatants to the various war zones, as officers in the British Army, the nurses had cabins and ate in the first class dining room with the male officers, enjoying full officer status. The enlisted men, on the other hand, existed in steerage conditions in the bowels of the ships. Nursing sister CMS Baker sailed from Glasgow to India in the spring of 1944. Once past the Bay of Biscay, she and a college requested an inspection of the men in steerage. Why they did so is not clear, though the acquiescence to the request by the ship's authorities suggests there was an appreciation of professional officer status of these nurses. However, whilst they were able to bear witness, they were powerless to effect change. We were appalled, not a strong enough word, by the stench of sweat, sickness and socks in the sleeping quarters. I am sure some men did not survive, but we had no information about this. The contrast between the high living of officers and the terrible low living of men herded like cattle was terrible and we were shocked into silence. But what could we do? We did nothing. This lack of action on the part of the nursing staff is also shared in Sister Penny Salter's memoir when she recalled that the humidity and heat in the blackout conditions became appalling as they cruised into the harbour at Freetown, Sierra Leone. She continued, as for the troops, they were going berserk for the state of affairs below deck had become almost suicidal and God only knows how they survived those few desperate days and nights. Although Salter, Hitchcock and Baker show determination elsewhere in their personal testimonies of their wartime work, it is clear there were boundaries to their influence that were non-negotiable. Notwithstanding the political and social manoeuvrings to limit the power of nurses and potentially challenge the significance of their nursing role, most, if not all, were aware of their importance to the healing of men. They knew that on the wards they were the officer in charge, the expert by the bedside, and they worked their work as creators of help their, their work as creators of healthful spaces for security, of security for healing was vital to the war effort, a role that did not need further negotiation. To conclude, when Sister Agnes Morgan wrote to her mother from a casualty clearing station in Rome, near Rome in nine, June 1944, she told her of the effort the nurses made. We strive to do a little extra that makes the difference between a CCS and a hospital. 
it is all impossible and rather hopeless as the tide of human misery and suffering streams in too fast for us to do more than the bare necessities under canvas and all the water in a can and all the sterilization by primer stove. The British and US nurses who were posted on active service overseas had learned their nursing work in hospitals and colleges in their respective countries. They had been trained to make their patients comfortable, to give them nutritious food, to keep them warm and hydrated and maintain their personal hygiene. All this was possible in the nation's hospitals with heating, running water, clean laundry and kitchens, kitchens producing the required food. On active service overseas, the fundamental elements were more challenging. To provide an environment in which their soldier patients could recover and heal was a constant battle, requiring ingenuity and innovation. US Army nurse Edith Ames wrote about her experiences on the hospital ship, the Arcadia, in an article to the American Journal of Nursing. Nursing aboard a, hosp aboard a hospital ship requires great versatility, she said. The position of nurses as women in a war zone compounded the challenges of to creating healing spaces for their patients. Women should not be at war, and there were limits to their authority. The nurses of both armies were aware of these limits, especially outside the environment of the hospital ward. Yet, within the ward, the ward itself, they were the officer in charge and the expert by the bedside. Whatever the men would suffer outside, they would try to mitigate inside. The ward became a homely space, a reimagined domestic place in which men could be safe, secure and recover. Thus, despite the challenges wrought upon nurses of both armies, many of whom had, before active service overseas, moved from their parental home to a nursing home and not much further, they raised their game, took on the challenge and supported the recovery of their soldier patients. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, very much. And uh, now we're going to, um, if anyone has any questions for Jane, uh, please, you can either unmute or you can type them in the um, chat box. And I'll start out because the things are always, are we slow there? How did you eventually, um, initially get interested in the topic of World War II nursing? Um, I don't know. I think we, there was a, I don't know how it started. I was working with a, why have we got that pic? Oh, we were, um, I was working with a colleague, Christine Hallett, who's an expert on First World War nursing. And um, I knew that whilst a fair amount of work had been done on that earlier conflict, very little had been done by the Second World War. Um, my great uncle had been in the reconnoiter infantry. Um, he'd been a tank driver in um, the desert. And whilst sadly I was too young and stupid to ask him about it when he was alive, I was aware that he'd done it and that was there was something rather incredible about what had he'd achieved or him and his regiment had achieved. Um, you know, being in a tank in the desert must have been just unbelievably awful. So I guess it was just um, a kind of morphing of lots of different things that I thought, I think I want to do this and I've been doing that. so. I think we had a big international conference um, in London in 2010 and somebody, one of my American um, nursing historian colleagues said, somebody should do a book on um, wartime nursing and Christine and I said, we are. And that was the book that um, won the prize. So um, it's been going on a, a while and it has become a, a it, is, it is a great love of mine. Thank you. The nurses were incredible. These women were just incredible what they took on. Uh, we have a question in the chat um, from Janice. She would like to know, were British or American nurses giving, uh, given any mission to nurse the survivors of concentration camps after their liberation? Yes. So um, when Bergen-Belsen, I've written a, a bit about this, when Bergen-Belsen was um, liberated, it was liberated, well, the British arrived on the 15th of April, 1945, and the nurses started to go in about five days later. Um, some of them were never able to speak about it again because it was just so unbelievably awful. Um, American nurses were, I think, 
helped to care for the patients at uh, inmates at Buchenwald. So there were um, nurses from the, both allied nations working to um, save lives. And in, in fact, of course, many, many of the inmates died once the, um, the allies had arrived because they arrived with um, quite rich food, high protein food, which these people who'd been starving for 12 years couldn't manage. And many of them died of, of diarrhea um, within a very short space of time of the of the allies arriving and then people realized that they had to do something about the diet that was being provided but there are some there are some archives um, at the uh, welcome and at the imperial war museum and they are very harrowing to read thank you uh, glenda would like to know if you were able to get information on uh, the nurses transition back to civilian life um, <laughs> yes, um, I, I did. so um, a lot of them actually married, either um, got married whilst they were on active service or um, met their future husbands. So a lot of them just um, at the end of the war, they left nursing altogether because they became wives because whilst the um, British government and the profession had lifted the official marriage bar during the um, second, during the war, which the marriage bar was a, a, a professional bar that prevented um, women from being a nurse if they were married. Um, the, it, officially it was lifted, but at the end of the war, many of them reinstated rules about living in hospital accommodation that would preclude unmarried women from working. So a lot of <clears throat> these immensely, immensely um, uh, experienced women just were left lost to the profession, which given that three years later we had a National Health Service was remarkably short-sighted. Um, and in fact, they couldn't staff the National Health Service. Um, so very short-sighted. Those who did stay in nursing, a lot of them went into public health because again, that gave them autonomy. Some of them stayed in um, services and some went and joined what was then the Colonial Nursing Service to work abroad. Um, I have to, many of them did not want to return to hospital practice because it was um, so stifling. And the, even the Royal College of Nursing um, published a pamphlet to say, you know, you might have you might have been a matron in your in a hospital on overseas practice service, but don't expect to come back to one of those um, senior positions. Now you're coming back to the UK and you'll have to get used to just being a bog standard nurse again. And it was just it was a bizarre piece of, of, of a pamphlet because, of course, everyone said, Right then, well, I just will go, and they did. So okay. um, that's what happened. Most of them left, oh, and if they, but not all, obviously, but a lot of them did. Yeah, from and it didn't necessarily get better. You know, reading oral histories from uh, nurses, military nurses um, in later conflicts. You know, American conflicts. You know, I'm thinking specifically of you know some Vietnam vets who were just. You know, thrown into this meat grinder where you know they had responsibilities you know almost including you know what surgeons did were doing and then would yes. come back to you know you're allowed to take someone's temperature and that's about it so yeah. and yeah, yeah and the the, the uh, memoirs that I read you know they talk about you know being excited to come back and you know the war was over and they were told basically just you know yes miss you it's yes sister no sister three bags full sister and um, you're right, go and take that temperature when they had been, you know, running hospitals in the middle of the desert and um, working, working um, to uh, um, expanding the nursing role. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yes, I think it's I think it was something that I agree. probably. Something. And, it's, and it happened at the end of the First World War as well. First World War nurses did exactly the same thing. They just were like, well, we're not doing this. Right. Um, and then let's see, I don't know why it went with a few comments. Let's see. Um, okay. Come on. Wow. Um, Betty Wolf wanted to, um, you know, sort of comment that, um, you know, sort of with the COVID epidemic you know, sort of nurses are, even though it's not officially wartime, they're, they're, you know, being put in, you know, incredibly stressful situations again, and that's, that's taken its toll. And, um, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the um, 
narrative about COVID and nursing for nurses, doctors and everybody, all healthcare staff has been, they've used narratives of war. So battling COVID, war-like crisis. Um, so I think that that trope has been used to, um, to, mm -hmm. so that, so to, for the general public to understand just what it's been like to nurse or be a doctor under, in COVID. Um, right. Uh, Glenda also uh, comment that current boards of nursing haven't changed much. <laughs> yes, trying to, I'm not, and I'm sure it's the same all across the world. Right. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're trying to do our, our part at UNCG. We have a veterans assistant program that um, uh, veterans who, I, I'm hoping I'm getting this completely right, uh, veterans who, you know, were in medical um, jobs while they're in the military, um, UNCG, you know, allows their experience to be applied for credit for bachelor's and yeah. degree here. I think uh, there, are, there are other universities, I've got colleagues right. at universities across at the States and that, that's, um, <clears throat> that's not uncommon. And it's, it's really, it's, it's good and it does show forward thinking. Right. Uh, Janice wanted, uh, commented that a woman I know who was a nurse in Vietnam Never nursed uh, again. Yeah. See. Um. I mean, it's, you know, I can't. A lot of them didn't give up nursing because they wanted to give up nursing. A lot of them gave up nursing because they had because they right. got married, and they they didn't right. really have a choice. And certainly, mm -hmm. once they had a child, there was no option. They they couldn't carry on nursing because there wasn't such a thing as part time work. Right. Um, it, yeah. Amir. I'm uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, and I was going to say, and, the, and the, all the government um, nurseries that had been set up during the war were closed. Right. Same. Yeah. Right. Same, same in the States. Yeah. And until I think the early 70s, if you had a child, um, you had to leave the U.S. military. It doesn't matter what what yeah. uh, events you had made. Um, did I miss any? Uh, for some reason, I'm having problems scrolling through. Um and it, I, I just have one final question of how your um, latest um, project is going about the Jewish nurses. That... Uh, well, it's it's been incredible. Um, I interviewed eight. Several of them have since died, which has been very sad. And they were, I mean, these women were in their nineties when they spoke to me. Um, okay. um, it's been very humbling. Um, and I'm about halfway through writing the book. So um, it's going all right. It's a slow process because, of course, right. I'm writing a book and of course I have teaching responsibilities and um, administrative responsibilities at, at my work. So um, these things, it'd be nice to be, have six months off to sit and write, but that's not going to happen. So it's it's going. It's 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 going. <laughs> it's all I can right. say. Right. Well, thank you very much. If, are there any other final questions that I I didn't see? Sarah Esther, Sean, are you seeing any that I missed? I don't see any that you missed. Okay, thank you, Sean. Well, 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 thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a real privilege to talk to you all. I hope you have a lovely Veterans Day. And um, thank you to Beth Ann so much for the invitation. It's been really so super. Thank you, Jane. Um, so um, I want this is the end of the official. Um, program. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And I really hope we can meet in 2022 in person. I want to thank all my colleagues in the library who helped me put this on. Um, and a big thank you to this year's sponsors, Glenda Schillinger, a Air Force Nurse Corps veteran, Pat Childers, a Navy veteran, um, Barb Kuharchek, an Air Force veteran, and an anonymous donor in memory of Joel Bolton McCarty Jr. Um, so thank you again, and I'm going to stay on for a bit if you, uh, you know, if you have any questions about the project, um, or if you'd like to share any memories of Betty, um, or really anything else. So thank you again, Jane. Thank you again, everyone. And, um, and bye-bye everybody. Have a lovely day. Okay. All right. Thank well, you bye. again, Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. And you can unmute if you want to say anything, and if, if not, um, you know. You can either stay or 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 go. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, where is this recording going to be?
able to be accessed? Um, the magic of Zoom, um, it's recording the cloud and, and uh, in a certain number of hours, they will send it to me and then I will send it out to everyone on our mailing list and it'll be on YouTube. It's not recording now, Beth Ann, if everything is over. Oh, yeah. fair enough.